He's the face of Turner Sports and the host of Inside the NBA. We're just like four guys sitting around in a living room watching a game. A lot of times the guy who's loudest gets heard. The script that caught him by surprise. I said, it's cancer. I mean, I don't know how else to come out and say it. That and more on today's 700 Club Interactive. Good morning and welcome to the show. Well, if you've watched a major sporting event over the past 30 years, chances are you know broadcaster Ernie Johnson. Recently, reporter Will Dawson sat down with Ernie to discuss life's unscripted moments away from the cameras. Take a look. He's one of the most respected broadcasters in sports. Best known for the nine-time Emmy Award-winning Inside the NBA with co-hosts Charles Barkley, Kenny Smith, and Shaquille O'Neal. We're just like four guys sitting around in a living room watching a game. And a lot of times the guy who's loudest gets heard. Much of the show's appeal lies in its offbeat, unscripted nature led by Ernie, who in another unscripted moment gave me a tutorial tying his signature bow tie. So this is the trademark NBA bow tie here. Ooh, yeah, this is pressure now. That's one take. Right I there. mean to tell you, that was ice water in the veins. Ernie Johnson gives up a center field single to Campanella. Ernie Johnson Sr. was a major league pitcher and later became the voice of the Atlanta Braves on TBS, giving Ernie Jr. a front row seat to baseball and a love for sports. And you go down to the field and you're hanging out in the batting cage and Hank Aaron is asking you how your little league team is doing. It was, it was pretty good. Good morning, now 825 and 40. Ernie would follow in his father's footsteps, not in baseball, but in broadcasting, working his way up through small market stations. That's when he met Cheryl. The two married and were on their way to an idyllic life. In 1990, Ernie got his big break when TNT asked him to become the NBA host. On the outside, it would appear that we've got it all. And I've kind of followed my script at that point. Beautiful wife, great job a boy and a girl that we had, you know, why mess with this? That's when the scripted life became unscripted. Cheryl sees this ABC special on uh, 2020 about these Romanian orphans being warehoused, especially the ones with disabilities. I said, I think we're supposed to adopt a Romanian child. And he laughed. <laughs> she kind of shook my head at first, like, oh, then it's like, you're serious. We had told the adoption agency we we're looking for a, a little girl under a year old, no permanent handicaps, that we could give a fresh start in the United States. Turns out the first child that she sees at an orphanage is this little boy who's almost three. And his legs were curled up and he couldn't speak and he was terrified of everything. And I called Ernie from Romania that night and I said, well, I saw this little boy and he doesn't meet any of the criteria, but I don't think I can live my life wondering what happens to him. And I can hear in her voice that, that her heart has been moved in a way I've never seen it. I said, bring him home. Michael Johnson came home in 1991 and was diagnosed with muscular dystrophy. Doctor said he would never talk and he would never bond with anyone. He walked, he certainly talks, and he bonds with everybody. Through all this, he becomes this remarkable, remarkable influence on people because he's got this tremendous spirit. Two years later, Ernie and Cheryl adopted again. And while life at home and work were busy, Ernie's career couldn't have been better. The only thing missing was church. Ernie thought it would be good for the kids. Turned out, he was the one affected. And we walk in and Within the first two weeks, I was getting pierced. And the more I heard, and the, and the mere fact that I was opening the Bible at the age of 41, why have I kept this hidden away and closed for so long? And so it basically went from a me-centered existence to a Christ-centered existence. 2003 was a big year for the NBA on TNT. They would televise their first All-Star game, and Ernie couldn't have been more excited. But just days before the game, Ernie discovered something that would make 2003 a big year for all the wrong reasons. And I'm, and I'm shaving on this side, and I could see a, you know, a bump 
that would rate when I when I made my face like this to do this. And I said, that's that's strange. I, I came up with a, a million different things that it could be. I said, it'll go away on its own. And, and it didn't. So Ernie finally decided to get it checked out. He thought it was a what's called a benign parotid tumor. But at least it alleviated your fears somewhat that it wasn't yeah, most likely yeah, cancer. Yeah, 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 because, because he, he used the word benign, and I was like, boom, you know, good. He said, but if you want a second opinion, I can set that up for you. The second opinion confirmed his worst fears. Ernie had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, an incurable but treatable form of cancer. And now he had to break the news to Cheryl and his kids. I said, it's cancer. I mean, I don't know how else to come out and say it. I don't wish that on any person. He was scared, and we were all scared. Ernie sought advice from his pastor, but he really just wanted to vent. I said, Kevin, right now, what I want to do is punch God right in the nose. Now, where are we right now? Are we trust with a question mark? And he's writing this stuff down on a brown Starbucks napkin. Are we going to trust God if? Are we going to trust God when? Are we going to trust with a question mark? Or are we going to trust God, period? And we're looking at, looking at John 9. And I'm looking at Jesus and the disciples with the blind man at the side of the road. But Jesus is basically saying, you're asking the wrong thing, guys. Not why did this happen. How's my father going to use it? And from that day on, that's, that became my, became my mantra. Trust God, period. Ernie, there was a time during that process that you became resolved sure. to beat this thing. Sure. When did that happen? Once you're told after those tests, okay, here's what you got and here's what you're going to do, then you just put your head down and go. Then you compete. And that's exactly what he did. Ernie's cancer battle was very public. And with a renewed trust in God, he never missed a show. Thanks to all you guys. And thanks to everybody out there who sent me emails and, and letters and, and phone calls and everything else. But so you I, know what the first I, thing I, everybody I does when you first get the ball head is. But of course. Yeah, yeah. Baby. Dealing with his cancer head on through treatments, Ernie got the news in 2007, he was cancer free. Things were back on track. But in 2011, his dad and best friend passed away. As he came to grips with the loss of his father, just two months later, Ernie got a call. His son Michael's life was in danger. And she's on the phone with me, and she's got a doctor there, and she says, we need permission to intubate. We need permission to put something down his throat to help him breathe. Uh, and I said, and if we don't, and he said, your son's gonna die. Michael was put on a ventilator. He would spend the next nine weeks in the hospital before finally coming home. He would never come off the ventilator, so Ernie and Cheryl turned Michael's bedroom into an at-home ICU. We're very clear he's borrowed. We want to borrow him as long as we can. Toughest guy I know, by the way. He's, this kid's been through so much. We have to do everything with Michael. We've got to scratch every itch. We've got to take care of every need. And. For us, there's something that is, that is deeply spiritual there because you wake up in the morning to serve. And while Cheryl and I have, you know, went into the whole adoption thing saying, maybe we can do something for somebody else to give them a better life. He's done more for us than we've done for him. In his new book, Unscripted, Ernie reflects on his own story and the lessons he's learned along the way. When I see the impact Michael's had, with his limited capabilities. When I look at my own personal episode with cancer, this is another page in this story that, that God's written for my life. When you've seen what he's done in the past, I say, okay, I'm gonna trust again. I'm not gonna trust if. Hey God, if this test comes back, okay, you and me, we're boys. Nah, it's not a question mark, not a comma, not an if, not a when. It's trust God, period.
Wow, Ernie Johnson, a man with a lot of wisdom, and we thank Ernie and his family for the tremendous example they are to us. And reporter Will Dawson is with us now, and Will's wearing his bow tie. I guess that was, uh, you, you learned that from Ernie himself. Well, right? Ernie Johnson is a bow tie Jedi, and I guess if I carry that terrible analogy further, I was the apprentice, he was Master Yoda, and you really, if you put one of these things on, oh, you, you almost have to have the force to do it. Did you know how to do it before you met with Ernie? I had tried it a few times, I actually owned a bow tie or two of the my own, on. and, and uh, yeah, no, it's not a clip-on. <laughs> Ernie, Ernie was the man. He taught you well. So he's a busy guy with his family and his oh, career. Absolutely. I mean, he is yeah. a very busy broadcaster, as well as a dad and husband. What was it like spending the day with him in his home and at the studios? Well, starting out with the studios, it was kind of, as a sports fan, a dream come true. He, he, he takes you around. Hey, you want to meet Shaq? Of course I want to meet Shaq. <laughs> so you have Shaq and you have Charles Barkley, who are NBA Hall of Famers, mm -hmm. guys that get a tremendous amount of respect. Uh, but with Ernie, uh, Ernie talks and everybody listens. It's, it's chaos around there, but it's... Uh, it's controlled chaos, and it's Ernie's chaos, and they really have a huge and a deep admiration and a love for Ernie yeah. Johnson. Yeah, it's evident. Now, talk about a little more about the family's desire to adopt. That was quite a test they took on in loving this child. Yeah, 25, 30 years ago in Romania, uh, you have this orphan crisis, and so these orphans, especially the ones with disabilities like uh, Michael, were being warehoused. Uh, the first and only day that Michael ever spent uh, outside was the day that he was abandoned in the park. And so he's taken into the, the orphanage, and when Cheryl goes over there, and they talk more about this in the book, I highly recommend the book, um, the lady at the orphanage said, boy, no good, don't take. And it's so, so different. Um, God's, God's economy is so different from, from, uh, from ours in this world. We, we place value in the wrong place. Uh, God says every life is valuable, and if you ask Ernie, he's going to tell you, especially, and, and I met Michael, that he is a, he's a tremendous, a tremendous young man. What do you think Ernie meant when he said that Michael just has this tremendous spirit? Because mm -hmm. someone may see the story and, and not see a whole lot of communication going on there. Sure. Uh, Michael is an influence on everyone that he meets. As you see in the photos there, Michael was asked to be part of this basketball team at his high school, not because he had a good jump shot or he could do anything, but because uh, it took everything that he had to do anything, maximum effort, and the coach there wanted his players to understand um, maximum effort is something that this guy gives all the time. And read the book, he is, uh, he turns out to have a huge impact yeah. on all these guys' lives. I was really um, given a lot to think about when Ernie Johnson talked about the cancer diagnosis and John 9 and that napkin moment when he's writing about trusting God. That's powerful stuff. Absolutely. And Ernie is a guy who's just, he's just a regular guy. Spending time with him, you see that. He's like a guy that you would uh, go over to his house after church, he and his wife, Cheryl. Um, but trusting God, trust God, period, through the ups and downs of life. I also think about adoption, uh, Andrew, and, and how um, Michael was, a, was rejected by the orphanage, uh, should have been rejected at the beginning, but um, again, in God's economy, uh, Jesus was despised and rejected by men, Isaiah 53, and he has a lot to say mm -hmm. about adoption. And uh, you know, for us as believers, that's who we were yeah. before we came to Christ. Yeah. He put his love, he set his love on us, and as a result, called us into his kingdom. It's, it's a beautiful story. Yeah. His, his, Michael's story, Ernie's story, uh, is just a beautiful testament to, to loving God and trusting God in the hard times. Very special family. And, and finally, uh, Ernie was heartbroken at his father's death in 2011. They had right. a very close relationship, didn't they? Absolutely, yeah. If you. If you were a kid like me and like you, guys our age, you remember before ESPN or when ESPN just got started, if you wanted to watch a baseball game during the week on a Tuesday night, you're either turning into w, mm -hmm. tuning into WGN or TBS. Or right? TBS. Yeah. And, and his voice was the voice of the Atlanta Braves, America's team. And actually, my love for baseball, his, his voice was the soundtrack sure. of that at a young age. So he and his father were so close. And again, I bought this book for my dad for his birthday just a couple of days ago. Uh, it's really a testament to intergenerational mm -hmm. uh, relationships and family and, and how, how tight-knit they actually were. And a lot of good lessons for lifelong believers when we encounter tough times. Absolutely. Great story. Thanks for the story, Will. We appreciate yeah. you being here. And if you'd like to hear more about Ernie's life, adoption, faith, surviving cancer, and sports broadcasting, the book is called Unscripted. 
the unpredictable moments that make life extraordinary, and it's available now wherever books are sold, and I also highly recommend you pick up a copy. Well, coming up, she's passing on a legacy through the power of Superbook. Find out why she says she loves Fridays. That's when we return. For Joanna Alexander, Superbook gives her a chance to see the heroes of the Bible in action. And it also gives her something fun to do with her family every week. Joanna Alexander loves Fridays because that's the night her grandchildren come to visit and they watch Superbook together. Superbook gives my grandchildren the Word of God. And the lessons I learned about watching Superbook is that not, not lie and not look down upon each other, which means not to be prideful or think that you're better than them. Joanna watched the original series as a young girl and has been a fan ever since. Now, as a member of the Superbook DVD Club, she receives a new episode every month. They all have a favorite. My favorite Superbook is Paul and the Shipwreck. Paul had to have a tremendous amount of faith. I am strong. My favorite character is Moses because he obeys God and he obeys the Ten Commandments. And every story teaches a different life lesson. I was watching Jacob and Esau, and I learned to not aggravate my brothers because I do it all the time. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> yeah. This Friday night, there were extra smiles. Oh my goodness, look at that! Because everyone got a new Superbook toy. That's, that's, that's Pharaoh. That's awesome! Yeah. It's not just the Word of God in your children. It's the Word of God in generations to come. And I am very grateful to Superbook for that. My family loves Superbook. I have three children and they love to uh, watch the new episode when it comes in. It leads to great discussions for our family about the lessons in the Bible, the people in the Bible. I highly recommend it. And when you join the Superbook DVD Club, you will receive three copies of the newest episode of Superbook for your gift of only $25. Every four weeks, you'll be one of the first to receive each new Superbook episode. And when you join today, we're going to send you three copies of our newest episode, Lazarus, and three bonus DVDs of The Last Supper, and three bonus DVDs of He is Risen. And that'll be nine DVDs for only $25 when you join the Superbook DVD Club today. And of course, want to let you know DVD Club members can stream all episodes of Season 1 and Season 2 for free. Just give us a call at 800-700-7000 or go to CBN.com to join the Superbook DVD Club now. Well, up next, a pastor who began losing his mind to dementia. Find out how he was miraculously healed. And I want to pray for you when we come back. So please stay with us. Well, Richard Scoff had no idea what was happening to him. He was just 60 years old when his brain began to misfire. Richard chalked it up to senior moments and denied anything was seriously wrong until it cost him his job. Pastor Richard Scoff kept a secret from his wife and from his church. I was having trouble writing checks and dialing the phone and I wasn't getting anything done. I would go to church and just lock myself in the office and not even answer the phone, not see anybody. And for a pastor, that's a hard thing. I thought it was an emotional problem. Like I thought, he's not caring or we're not connecting like we used to. What's going on here? It soon became evident to the church board that something was wrong with her pastor. Gina Clausen remembers what it was like to talk to Richard. He would get fixated on things and it just, you'd have a conversation and you'd think, something's not right here. I couldn't control my brain. I, I, people would say things to me and it, I would answer them, but it'd be, it wouldn't even be what they were talking about. The church board asked Richard to step down from his position and to see a doctor to determine the nature of his problems. Through an MRI and CAT scan, his doctor determined that Richard had early onset Lewy body disease, a form of dementia and Alzheimer's with no known cure. When the doctor said, your husband, you know, has dementia, Lewy body disease, and he's not gonna get better. That was the hardest day of my life to hear that. It was so hard. 
to have this happen, it was just like, how can this happen to a man of God? This is so major, this is my life, it's over. You know, I mean, I thought it was over. I thought my life was over. The doctor said the symptoms would only get worse and advised the couple to move to a single-story home because Richard would not be able to walk up or down steps. Despite the discouraging prognosis, they believed God could heal and restore Richard's mind. When she'd really be down sometimes, you know, about it, I'd go, honey, I said, this is no more than a cold for God. You know, we've seen God heal so many things. We've seen him heal backs. We've seen him heal, you know, we've seen him heal all kinds of things, you know, cancers and everything. And now this is, this is not a big thing for God. God can deal with it. We practiced the protocol of what the Word of God says is if anybody's sick among you, you know, then the leaders of the church, the elders of the church should lay hands on that person and pray over them in faith. And they stood in faith and expectation. We just kept standing on the Word of God and just, even though days you wouldn't feel it, you, you might see Him and be discouraged, but we just didn't look at that. We just kept looking to the Word of God. Richard says that during a time of prayer, he heard God tell him to use all the tools available for his healing, including nutrition. He started taking coconut oil. We took high antioxidant juices, changed our diet radically, and we started to really invest in our health. They soon began to see improvement in his memory and mental capacity. This is huge, you know what I mean? We, I'm able to dial the phone, you know? I'm able to go up the steps without tripping, you know I mean? This is big. Two years after Richard's diagnosis, their doctor was amazed by the level of his recovery. When the doctor came out and said, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it. Well, we'll tell you what we're doing. <laughs> we prayed. <laughs> it was God. It was God. But we used all the tools. You know, we were open to, we felt like the Holy Spirit saying, change your diet. Add these things into your diet. This is going to help him. They attribute Richard's healing to their faith in God and to following his directions. Richard is able to preach again and is sharper than he was before Thank his you. struggle with Hallelujah. dementia. He's alive. He's, death could not hold him down. I've got my husband back. That is amazing that I've got him back fully. Jesus said, with man it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. And we had to hold on to that scripture. We had to stand on the Word of God. I, you need to get a scripture and you need to stand on it and say, no, my God says, by His stripes I am already healed. I am not sick, I am well, fighting off some foreign substance, trying to come into my body, and I will not allow it, and Jesus, I know that you're healing me, and confess it and live it. Some right now maybe we've just seen that story, and, and I think of Psalm 25 where the psalmist said, Lord, look upon my affliction and distress. And you may feel so weary and so beaten down with what you're facing, that it could be hard for you to pray. Maybe you're exhausted. And it is my privilege now to pray for you. If you feel like you can't even voice it through the pain, allow this to be a moment where I can pray for you and all the viewers watching, we can pray together for what it is you are facing. Let's, let's bring our needs to the Lord, <clears throat> excuse me, who loves us dearly and desires to hear us cry out to him, Father God, we know you were wounded for us on that cross, and we think of the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, Father God. By your stripes, we are healed. And Father God, I pray for those now who are weary and beaten down and exhausted, who are questioning maybe even your faithfulness like that pastor did. I'm a man of God. Why is this happening to me? So Father God, help us understand in the midst of our circumstances what your plan is and where you are, Father God. We know you are a faithful, loving God, but Lord, in some moments, it can be difficult to trust. So Lord, we think of the cross, and that's where the power is. We think of your death, and we think of your resurrection, Father God, that you defeated death. And now, in the name of Jesus, I speak healing upon the people crying out for physical healing. If you need physical healing, now touch that part of your body or name it. Father God, you see the need, you see the hurt. Lord God, but you see the mustard seed of faith as well. 
And I pray right now that your Holy Spirit will minister to those in desperate need of healing and of hope. For those who have lost hope, Father God, let us focus on the cross and your resurrection and your love for humanity. Thank you, Almighty Father, for sending your Son, Jesus, to die for us so we could spend eternity with you. Thank you for hearing our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. We leave you with Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, a great reminder. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will.